That's not a comic book. Now that's a comic book. To tell if I'm actually live or what's going on. I think I'm live. I think everything's working. I don't know. There's a lot of stuff. I'm trying a new method with YouTube and uh, it's, um, it's very confusing. Anyway, here we are live for Comic Reviews. Sorry I missed last week. Had a lot of stuff going and just too many books to make it work. Thought about recording a different day, but just that, that just didn't happen. So anyway. Uh, I do have, because of a lot of books last week and, you know, just a few books this week, I do have quite a bit, so I'm just going to get right into the stream. We're starting off with Wonder Woman, number 75, The Flash, number 75, Batman Beyond, number 34, Doctor Strange, number 16, Justice League Dark, number 13, Justice League Dark Annual, number 1, Action Comics, number 1013, Green Lantern, or The Green Lantern, annual number one, and then Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man number nine. Lots of stuff, lots of things. Anyway, so let's go ahead and get started with Wonder Woman number 75. So I've talked about G. Willow Wilson's run a lot at this point, and while I do enjoy it, it's definitely got that, it's just a constant thing, I think, of when it's written for trade, unless it's like exceptionally high quality, really, you know, in-depth, great storytelling, I tend to lose interest as I read in singles, no matter how just generally good the quality of the run is. I think that her writing is pretty genuinely strong. I think she's got a great voice for Wonder Woman. I liked some of the stuff in the early arc. But as the art continues, I'm just, like, finding myself getting kind of, like, all right, all right. Um, and I think I'd feel that less if if she did what, what I prefer a lot of writers to do, which is just break it up a bit, you know, do an arc, do an issue, do an arc, do an issue. And she's, she's done shorter arcs, which really helps, but eh, just, I don't know. It doesn't. It doesn't quite work as well for me um, to do these these you know relatively short arcs. Um, and in any case, though, it's a pretty good issue, and it's it's kind of starting to tie a bunch of things together, which I like. We've got Grail, the daughter of Darkseid, kind of you know taking over uh, Hippolyta's throne. We've got Wonder Woman rediscovering the Amazons, and that's nice and sweet. And I. I really like the writing in the moment. Um, you know, this this art is great of Diana coming home for the first time in years um, and, and thinking that she never would be able to and just being overwhelmed, and so she just starts to dance with her sisters. I really like that. That's really good emotional stuff. That's, that's you know, that's sweet. Um, but as the story goes on and they start to, like, attack, this should probably be two issues. It helps that it's, it's double-sized. But they start to attack um, the Grail, who's taken over Themyscira, and that gets kind of interesting. You get some cool action, and also you get the, the moment of Wonder Woman doesn't... She's not a murderer. She doesn't kill people. She always gives them a chance, and so that kind of... You know, extends the battle out, and again, we do get some really awesome art. I mean, I cannot lie, that looks fantastic. I hated, hated Grail and, and the whole Dark Side storyline um, when... Uh, I can never remember his name. Starman Guy, the, the previous writer before Wilson, not counting Orlando. Um, when he was on the book, I was just dreading every issue sometimes. And the, the stuff with Grail and Darkseid was pretty boring overall. But, you know, I, I think Wilson had a strong take when she came onto the book. She said, a lot of people seem to just do Wonder Woman's origin again, and that's because they can't really get a handle on the character unless they go back and start it over. And so, yeah... Yeah, I kind of I kind of understand that. So it's it's respectable if nothing else to take something that you might not agree with and try to make it work. And I think that's what Wilson's doing here. So again, well, I might sound like I'm critical and saying I'm not super into how Wilson's writing this where it's pretty much just 
ongoing arc after ongoing arc after ongoing arc that's all tying back to the very beginning with this whole quest for the Olympians thing. It is well written. It is well handled. Um, and again, just... Man, the art there is really quite something to behold. I, I gotta say, I'm really, really digging the art in this. Um, let's see, Akuma Ranger says, How is Willow's take on Grail so far? I mean, this is the first issue, besides the first issue of her run, where we've seen Grail again. But her take on Grail is, is pretty strong. Um, she doesn't come off as very dark side esque but she does come off as, as pretty brutal, brutal, which is nice. Um, where's my mother? Go to Hades. Answer me. She's in a tomb, the same place she entombed me. You'll never see her again. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, like, generic villain writing, but she does come off as menacing. Um, and that's, that's refreshing. Ultimately, it's it's got a pretty typical Wonder Woman kind of situation where you think she's going to defeat the villain, but really it's about, you know, it's about trying to, to bring the humanity out of them, which is really nice. Um, so, like, Wonder Woman is, is put in kind of a no-win situation where Veronica Kale's daughter is being held hostage by Grail, and... Um, you just get this this moment of the Amazons kind of rally together and and cap and defeat Grail uh, with without any casualties on that side of things, which is nice. And then you get this really really sweet moment, and again, just beautiful art of Wonder Woman hugging her mother. You know, seeing Apollo again for the first time. That's it's a really great image. I love that Wonder. I always imagine Wonder Woman is very tall. She is at least six foot. Um, I love the idea that her mother is even taller. <laughs> That's great. Um, so yeah, pretty good stuff. This, of course, as you see on the uh, the covers, tying in with the whole year of the villain thing. And so we have Lex Luthor's drones out and about and handing out, you know, the good the goodies to all the villains. And so Cheetah's getting a sword that can kill a god uh, in order to use it against Wonder Woman. So. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. See how it goes. See what happens. It's interesting. Um, let's see here. What's going on in the live chat? Uh, Michael Scambati says, Detective Comics number 1008. Thoughts? Haven't read it. Not as good as Detective Comics 475 and 476, The Life and Fish and Batman number 321, Dreadful Birthday, Dear Joker, in my humble opinion. Okay, cool. What happened in 1008? Was was it even kind of related to the Joker? I mean, I have to assume so, but I, I really have no idea. Anyway, let's go ahead and move on. Talk about The Flash, number 75. This is the um, finale to The Flash, year one. And I actually, again, I will give Joshua Williamson some credit. Um... I've been up and down on his run. I've I've had moments where I'm like, eh, is this really it? Um, I'm getting alerts from YouTube. That's weird. Um, this isn't distracting at all, guys. Anyway, I I've been kind of up and down on Joshua Williamson's writing, and I was like, all right, I'm curious enough about his take on Barry Allen's origin. Is it going to be just, you know, you can't do his origin as just complete ripoff. The the whole thing with the reverse flash has kind of been done to death at this point. What are you going to do? Um, and i I got to give him some credit. I thought the idea of using the turtle and creating a time loop as the flash's origin is kind of a cool idea. Especially given that, like, the, the time loop is... You became the Flash, and then the turtle came back in time with the older version of yourself and enslaved Central City, and you were never able to defeat him, but you were always able to keep him from getting your speed and, and creating chaos and, and destroying the multiverse until this moment where he captured you and came back in time. So you've got this interesting time loop, and this is the story of the Flash, that the, the version of the Flash in that time loop 
that broke out of it and got to become the hero that we know. I think that's pretty clever. Um, the execution of how he gets there is a little... It's It's got its moments. Um, he kind of inspires the people of Central City to rise up against the turtle, which is is kind of cool. i got to give it some credit there. Um, we also get like a Super Saiyan Flash moment, which is kind of neat. Uh, he kind of, you know, uses the speed force and becomes the embodiment of hope of Central City. And yeah, I mean, Howard Porter's art's always fantastic, so you got to appreciate that, if nothing else. Um, overall, like, it's there's really not much to talk about outside of the main plot. There's some character work I like. I like the way Iris is written. I like that that's kind of the thing, you know, Flash fighting for Central City and, and you know, saving everyone and becoming that embodiment of hope as, like, the reason that Central City loves the Flash as much as it does and that's why he gets, you know, Flash days and parades and stuff. Okay. All right. I can dig that. That's That's a pretty good way for, like, like his big first outing is not something that, he caused something completely external to him and he inspired the city to band together that's that's a pretty good unique take on him i like that quite a bit um and so yeah so barry you know comes flash and he and iris start dating and she then he meets wally and wally wally and wallace um and that kind of just is going to lead to the legacy of the Flash. And again, if nothing else, that's a great ass image from Howard Porter of all of the different speedsters that spun out of the Flash book. So we'll go here. We got we got Wally West, Wallace West, Barry Allen. Oh, some of these are hard. All right, Jesse Quick, Max Mercury, uh, Jesse Quick, Max Mercury, Jay Garrick. Bart Allen Impulse. I don't know those other three. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm at a loss, y'all. I'm sorry. Um, but that's, that's pretty cool. You know, just get that image of, like, the, the legacy, the, the, you know, future that, that Walt Barry creates. You gotta appreciate that. Uh, we then get a flash forward that kind of sets up the year of the villain stuff and, and the arcs going forward. I don't know how much I'm going to be into Williamson's run from here on out. I wanted to pick up year one and see if he could win me back over. And I gotta say, once he flashes forward... I am still really liking it. Like him, the Flash running around town and, and helping everybody out is pretty classic stuff. Goes and finishes work on the Flash Museum because he doesn't want everyone else to have to do it. Um, you know, just I don't know. There's there's some interesting stuff there. Then we got this tie-in with the the Year of the Villain stuff with Captain Cold working on the Suicide Squad and then. Lex Luthor offering him some other shit. I don't know. Uh, I'm not particularly interested in Year of the Villain, to be perfectly honest. Uh, yeah. I don't know. It's just... It's whatever. That's that's all I got. It's just whatever. I, I have little interest in it because it's just a big event, but I will say it's at least being done well where half of this stuff from what I'm reading, is just like, okay, so Bendis, you have this this whole Invisible Mafia and Red Mist plot going on. Um, what if Lex Luthor just came in and gave you a MacGuffin so that you can make your villain even more threatening? Well, I mean, they were already going to be really threatening. Yeah, yeah, but like, just we're just doing a thing. That's that's my take on Year of the Villain. It's like, okay, just just tie in a thing. To, to Year of the Villain. Just Lex Luthor gives him a, a MacGuffin. All right, whatever. Um, that's just kind of how every issue is feeling, so whatever. It's fine. I'd prefer that's how events are written anyway. Uh, next we have Batman Beyond, number 34. Eh, I am still enjoying this, but the, the gag's getting old, and that just seems to be the problem with Dan Jurgens is... 
this really, yeah, we're in part four of this story. This was like a two-issue story, maybe three, and we're going into part five because it doesn't end here. Uh, False Face has possessed Terry McGinnis or, or is, is pretending to be Terry McGinnis. I don't know how False Face's powers work. And he's like, like, okay, you have the power to assume the identity of anybody that you come in contact with, you come into contact with. And as far as everyone can tell, you are that person. You have, like, everything you need to just pretend to be that person. And you don't even have to worry about that person showing up on you because as long as you're possessing them, they do not remember who they are. Great. How do you fuck up that power set by just being this different <laughs> twice? <laughs> like, it's, it's so weird. So, like, False Face kind of, you know, takes over Terry McGinnis' life and just decides, oh, yeah, I'll just I'll throw a guy off a bridge and, and hit on a woman that I'm rescuing. And, like, what the shit, Dan Jurgens? It's just, it just comes off as really lazy writing. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's pretty much the whole issue is, oh, Terry's False Face now, and then they figure it out, and they're, I don't know what we're going to do. Um, I do like this villain Split, I think that's his name, uh, where it's two brothers kind of like working together and they, they fuse into one body, but then when the, then they can unfuse and they're speedsters. Reasonably clever. Um, again, it just, it feels like it's too drawn out. So anyway, uh, yeah. Terry's in some shit without really realizing it, so it's fine. Uh, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm always at this point with Dan Jurgens' Batman Beyond, where I'm like, "This is kind of cool. This is kind of neat. I can I can get into this." And then I'm like, twelve minutes later or twelve issues later, I'm like, "God, is this still happening? Jeez." <laughs> Ugh. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Talk about Doctor Strange, number 16. And I, I don't like to do this too much, but Dan Jurgens could learn from Mark Wade. We're in, what is this, part four? Uh, or part five. We're in part five of Harold Supreme storyline. And again, that sounds like something you get at Taco Bell, but still. We're in part five of this, and it's just... It feels more natural like everything about the premise feels like it's deserved everything about the premise feels like it's taking up all the time it needs to and you're not losing anything so this issue not a lot of plot happens what happens in this issue i can do it in like two sentences the magic users of the marvel universe band together to try to fight magic and power Dorm dormammu absorbed Galactus and they're not succeeding and then Doctor Strange brings in the physical heroes in the Marvel Universe from all across the galaxy and they all try to fight Doc Galactus and it doesn't work and then Doctor Strange reveals that was the plan all along to let Galactus absorb the lives of thousands of beings of immeasurable power so that too much of him changed to let Galactus gorge himself. And then Doctor Strange could come in with his master plan. And he does, and it's a big dramatic moment. And then you get a really masterful cliffhanger where you turn the page and Doctor Strange is in white space and we have no idea if his gambit succeeded. That's great. That's great. It's it's a lot of cool action. You get a lot of neat visuals, and, and there's cool like descriptions of what everyone's doing. Black Bolt screams at Galactus, and it actually like pushes him back. That's pretty neat. Um, there's just a lot of cool moments. A lot of, you're getting a lot of bang for for your buck in this story, but it doesn't feel like it's overstaying its welcome. I feel like if Jurgens was writing this, this would be like three issues of a nine-issue arc, you know? And I'm just like, you don't need it. Wade sets up the threat in a couple, or sets up the situation in an issue, establishes the threat, leads you down a false road for dramatic intent, then corrects, 
shows you another direction with a bunch of cool action and then leaves you on a cliffhanger. That's a nicely told, very engaging story that feels like it justifies five issues. And, and I don't know, maybe I wouldn't be saying that if I was, if I was at the end of, of Jurgen's run or something, you know? Maybe I'd, I'd be like, or, or maybe I wouldn't be saying that if I hadn't just read, or talked about the Jurgen's comic and, and switched over to this. But it just the feel of it's so much more streamlined and, and so much better, and you just can't help but like kind of compare the two when you talk about them back to back. So I think this is a very well told story, and again, the art in here is pretty damn cool. Like for all the Black Bolt fans, this is going to be on the feet list for a while. Like we've got a Galactus that's even more powerful than regular Galactus. Um, and Black Bolt is screaming at him, and it doesn't destroy him, but it's having an effect, which is just not something anyone else can do to Galactus, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, I appreciated that. That was pretty cool. Very Cosmic Marvel book. I guess I really like Cosmic Marvel for some reason, which is weird, but here we are. Um, yeah, good issue. Alrighty. Next, I'm going to be jumping between my weeks just a little bit here because I've got Justice League Dark number 13 and Justice League Dark Annual number 1. Um, I just decided since the annual came out this week and I'd already had the Justice League Dark issue to talk about, I just put them back to back. Um, so Justice League Dark number 13, I guess this is like the official point for the the future of the book. Um, yet issue 1 to 12, and in that you include the Witching Hour crossover, uh, there's there's a pretty good sense of a story developing. And, and issue 12 kind of ends at a natural conclusion where Dr. Fate, who's kind of been the, the mastermind behind every threat they've faced, or, or not the mastermind, been the, the impetus of every threat they faced, you know, is is defeated. And so you have number 13 kind of starting the next uh, line of, of the story, the next part of the arc. Um, and it does it does pick up and, and lead pretty seamlessly, which I think is is an impressive part about this. Um, so we get a retelling of Dr. Fate's origin. That's fine. Uh, I, I didn't find it particularly interesting, but the art is pretty damn gorgeous. Um, I like I like how that all works. You know what I like about this, just looking at it, is I don't really have to tell you anything. You're just kind of getting the gist of it. You know, like, you, you can visually see everything that's happening, and you don't even need the, dial, the narration in here. I really appreciate that. Who did the art on this issue? Um... Mark Buckingham. Okay, yeah. So that was that was pretty good. Um, and then it cuts to the uh, headquarters of Just League Dark, and they're discussing, you know, what what do we do about Doctor Fate? We've got the helmet. Doctor Fate is a big name in the magical community, even though he just went off the rails. He's a big name. We're the Just League. He's supposed to be a hero. Should we give the helmet to someone? and have Dr. Fate on the Justice League Dark, and Kent Nelson's like, fuck no. Um, no one's touching this helmet. Maybe my apprentice, and his brother's like, fuck no! <laughs> no one's touching this helmet! Um, and I like that. It's, it is, it's pretty reminiscent of Young Justice. Uh, in season one, where they had Dr. Fate's helmet there, but it was like, uh, oh no, anyone that puts it on might never come out. Okay. All right. You know, I did it. I, I can feel that. That's that's pretty cool. Uh, using Dr. Fate in that manner, I think, is a pretty cool move. And so I'll, I'll give it some props for that. Um, then we have the second uh, story. or This, this issue is split into three chapters. Uh, the first one is all about Dr. Fate. The second one is about John Constantine and Zatanna. Um, 
And something I didn't realize about Constein, or maybe this this probably new to continuity uh, for for Tinian, um, is Zatanna's father kind of, as as John puts it, um, used him for his dirty work. Um, your dad recruited me out of the nut house at age nineteen and made me do his dirty work for years before he died. I don't know what you want me to say. That's that's kind of interesting. Um, so Zatanna is kind of mad because John's been keeping secrets from her and has apparently been been on a mission her father gave him for years, manipulating her behind the scenes. Um, and she wants to know the truth of it. And John's like, even if I wanted to tell you, I can't because my lips are magically sealed. Go get Wonder Woman in a rope. And then he kind of goes through, like, you know, some of his origin stuff. I love that the art style changes here to that more 80s Vertigo era style. Or 80s, 90s Vertigo era style. That's pretty cool. Um, as, as John talks about his, his history. Uh, and so, yeah, it's just kind of an interesting little moment. And, and it looks like John and Zatanna are, um, are on rocky ground. She says... Uh, and if we survive, I never want to see you again as, as she leaves, because the, the plan is to get her father out of the um, the realm of the other place, which is kind of cool. I really like that. Uh, there's, you know, there's drama, there's, there's like a plan. It's, you know, the, <laughs> the Zatanna and Constantine shippers are, are worried sick because, oh no, this is the end of their relationship. This is how... Drama works in comic books, people. <laughs> if you want characters to get together, wait a good 20, 30, 40 years. <laughs> um, then we have chapter 3, which is the year of the Valentine stuff. Uh, Cersei is approached by Lex Luthor, and he says, Hey, what if I were to offer you a magical army? Next time, the Injustice League Dark. So, yeah, that's that's it. Um, again, Cersei's been set up as a villain, like, pretty much the whole, the whole series. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of ridiculous how much of a villain she's been. Um, you know, kind of like a fake-out villain at first. But yeah, she's, she's been, like, plotting and scheming behind the scenes in this whole series. So it just feels like, yeah, Tinian was just leading to Cersei being a villain. But then... It's like, oh, hey, can, can you maybe have, like, Lex Luthor give her a little, like, nudge or a little, like, assist or something? I'm like, yeah, I guess. It just works with my run anyway. So here we go. Event! Um, but, yeah, that's that's all that is. So, pretty good issue. Liked it quite a bit. Uh, I'll switch over and talk about the Justice League Dark Annual, number one. Um, Swamp Thing Exile. It's a Swamp Thing story. It's It's a Swamp Thing story. Uh, you could maybe just call this Swamp Thing special number one. Um, it's 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 a Swamp Thing story. The Justice League Dark is in. Let's count them. Uh, one, two, two, two panels. Or yeah, two pages. Two pages worth of Justice League Dark. Uh, Constantine's there, and it, he just he just fits in the Swamp Thing story. You you don't. You don't need the Justice League Dark. It's just a Swamp Thing story. Not that that's bad. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But it is 100% a Swamp Thing story. Um, so due to the events of the Witching Hour in Justice League Dark, the Parliament of Trees is no more. It has been destroyed and it has been replaced with the Parliament of Flowers. As such, Swamp Thing is no longer the chosen avatar of the green. He's just a walking plant monster. Um, and the Green has chosen a new avatar, and he will be the King of the Flowers. And he looks like a villain. Like, I'm sorry, that design just looks very, very villainous right out the gate. So you're a little like, alright, well, what's going to be this guy's deal? And the Swamp Thing approaches him right away. He's like, hey, listen, you're not this guy you think you are. You are something else. Let me take you to your body so you can see that this is not you. Um, that's kind of an interesting way to approach things. But then 
old dude refuses to accept it and immediately wants to try to go back to his old life and realizes years has passed and his wife has moved on and yada yada and then it's approached by Jason Woodrow and it gets it gets pretty complicated there's a lot of text in this one I mean just whew, uh, especially especially when you start reading the journals of the guy that became um, the the new avatar for the green uh, that that starts to get maybe a little much uh, as you you start to see his notes and how damn um, like biological they get, which gets kind of annoying. Uh, like I'm trying to find. There's one point in which it's like bull science. It's just nothing but bull science, um, and that that got a little exhausting. Um, and I was just like, okay, yeah, we'll just, just keep reading this, I guess. Um, but the story is, you know, it's got that very Swamp Thing-esque story. Uh, the guy keeps creating children to try to replace the child his wife and he lost. And he's trying to watch him from afar. But then he realizes that he killed himself. And he's creating these children with these memories that are kind of based on his... Psyche. So the only thing they know how to do as far as death goes is to commit suicide, which is a horrible trauma for the wife he's tried to, you know, pass these children off on to. Um, and so he, he can't do it. He can't be the King of Flowers. He can't be the Avatar of the Green. And he has to lie down and try to rest. And at that point, Jason Woodrow just, like, eats him, which is kind of badass, not going to lie. Um... And then Swamp Thing's all talking to John Constantine's like, oh, everything went wrong. Yep, that's a Swamp Thing story. Um, and then we get Jason Woodrow, who's consumed the King of Flowers and taken on his final form. Um, and then he's approached by Cersei, who I love that they're just playing with Cersei's design left and right. That's really, really fun. Tinian did that great moment where he took like Cer Cersei's DC Rebirth design and she's like bow before me Amazon and then Diana's like hey listen there's this bad thing going on she just pops back into the Greg Rucka era with Liam Sharp design and it's like oh god I'm so sorry this is gonna get so bad and then she so like she just the the drama of, of superhero dumb is just a fun thing super villain dumb sorry it's just a fun thing that Cersei does because she's been alive for thousands of years and she needs entertainment. That's that's pretty good. Um, yeah, so uh, Cersei recruits Jason Woodrow uh, because of this Year of the Villain stuff. So that's that's going on. Um, eh. it's, it's really all I got. For, for this one. It's fun. It's a Swamp Thing story. It's got, like, barely anything to do with Justice League Dark, but that's okay. Been watching the uh, the Swamp Thing show on DC Universe. It's uh, it's really good. Kind of sucks that it only got those those ten episodes, and even that was shorter than it was supposed to be. Um, damn, I'm worried that app's going to go, which is too bad because I really, really enjoy having it. Oh, well. Let's go ahead and move on. Talk about Action Comics number one thousand and thirteen. Um, there are things I like in this issue, but there's, there's it's so plot heavy and, and shit that it's it's getting to the point where it's going to be too complicated to talk about without having to just explain the whole plot again. So I'm just going to go with the let's assume you've read it and let's talk about some of the specific stuff that's like well done storytelling in comics. This double page spread I really like because it's a conversation between Barry White and Miss Good and you start here and you work your way across the page this way and then you hit Perry White's speech bubbles and you go down and you work your way and his, his hand serves as good visual lines so you work your way across the page this way and then you read her dialogue which leads your eye naturally down and then you work your way back across the page this way. It's a nice little uh, Z formation kind of sorta so I like that that was, that was pretty cool um, that's that's just good storytelling in comics so I, I appreciated the the way that was laid out um, you get 
some of the stuff going on with Leviathan and Rose slash Thorn, who's introduced in the last issue, and that's developing that plot in a number of ways. You got the Year of the Villain stuff tying in here too, with uh, Good's inability to perfectly hold her form. Um, and there was one scene that I did really, really enjoy. Superman notices Rose slash Thorn tearing shit up with Leviathan members, and he goes and confronts them and starts talking to Leviathan guy, or Leviathan henchman. And it's just a really cool interrogation scene that I quite liked, where, like, Superman's just so... It, it, he's so, like, relaxed and calm and, and non-confrontational. Like, I just really like Superman's dialogue with this, this you know, essentially henchman guy. What's your name, son? I, I will not fight you, sir. Thank you. What's your name? Thank you for the assist, Thorne. I can take it from here. Why can't I see through this armor with my x-ray vision? Oh, God. I'm going to remove this faceplate. Is this armor at all booby-trapped? Oh, God! I don't want to hurt you. How does this come off? I don't know. You don't know how your armor works? I actually, at this moment, just realized I don't know if this armor is booby-trapped. I didn't create it. It was given to me. Oh, God, you're going to... You are not going to believe me. I can hear your vitals. I believe you. What is your name? You're, you're going to be on board with this, Superman. I know not today, but all of us, we really believe that you will. We are going to change the world, and tomorrow you'll... Who is we? We are Leviathan. We, we won't fight you. Okay, people are getting hurt, and I don't have time for... And then, like, all of a sudden, you, you think, oh, no, the guy's going to blow up. Um, then you get a cool page turn, and suddenly Superman's in India. And he's like, okay, and he just has to jet off. Which is really neat. I, I like that. That's a, a cool moment. So you've got, like, this villain, and we've uh, been assuming that it's been, that this villain has been blowing up, you know, all these intelligent agencies and, and wiping them out. But this is our first hint, or not our first hint, because there's, there's been, like, a discussion so far of, oh, what about bodies? So we're not finding any bodies for anyone at any of these facilities. And so, suddenly Superman is caught in a big blue explosion, and he's teleported halfway across the world. That, that gives you a big indication that these, these facilities, these intelligent agencies, went somewhere. And so it's, it's kind of deepening the plot, it's giving these cool moments, and I really do like that. And it's, it's just told in a, in a good moment in story that gets you into the, the character writing. Um, you really can tell that Superman is a character, or is a, is a unique character for Bendis to write, and he really wants to, you know, flex a bit and show, no, I can do this, I can write this character. And I 100% agree. I do think Bendis can write Superman in a way that is interesting and is engaging. Um, my unfortunate side is I don't like some of the choices he's made along the way. Uh, Manos is in the comments and he says, I was thinking about getting back to Bendis' Superman, but I've been hearing a lot of mixed and ba to bad reviews about it. Um, so I would say read his action. I think his action comics, you, you got to start with Man of Steel, which is the, the six issues that set up both runs. I think his action comics is his best writing and it works really really well on its own you don't need to be reading superman for it you don't need to be reading any of the other tie-ins except for just event leviathan number one um and it's just telling you know a pretty good story that's that's you know putting putting superman in a light that we don't normally see him while still keeping up with a lot of the trappings of his world there's super scientists and crazy organizations and all this stuff. But it's... At the heart of his story so far has been a mystery and some really unique ideas. And just... Bendis has done a lot of really interesting world building with Superman, which is something that I'm always interested to see people do with this whole invisible mafia thing. Um, so I'd say, yeah, read the Man of Steel miniseries, then just go to action, um, read Event Leviathan. 
I don't hate the Superman run, but that one's been a lot weaker because I just cannot get on board with the choices he's made for John Ken. So hopefully that does something for you. Um, and again, Bendis' dialogue for these characters is just really, really solid. Um, Perry White and Clark Kent having a conversation. They teleported Superman to India and took, and took off. Lois and I are working on a Leviathan theory, actually, that the Leviathan power signature that destroyed Argus Spiral, the DEO, what if it were not so much destructive as if shifting? Okay, Kent. So they didn't fight Superman, they moved Superman. They moved the DEO, Argus. Maybe. Where to? I have, I have to come up with that. Two. If you want your paycheck... Where the spy organizations destroyed or moved to another location, maybe instantly sucked into whether whatever this Leviathan is becoming. That's interesting, but it's too bad you don't publish a paper full of my theories. It is too bad. Get more. Is Superman going to be on record? 100%. I have it on, in my notes. He was very clear that he wants the public to know whatever we know about Leviathan. If people know Superman's involved, that might help her repressed growing terror of the Leviathan event. He feels it will save lives. Okay, I want to put it... I want you to put it together with Robinson. She might have the other half of this. Where is she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I really did like that. I, I thought that was cool. Um, and Mano says, I'm reading the Lois Lane series. Me too. I, I really, really love that first issue. I'm really curious to see what the rest of the book can be, if it can even be half as good as that first issue. So I think, you know, Bendis, love him or hate him, I think he's creating an exciting time for Superman, which which is cool. Um, I've never read comics when Superman's had an exciting time. Not necessarily a good time. Like, I'd call the 90s an exciting time for Superman, too. But I've never read comics when Superman was having an exciting time. And I feel like that's what this is. So, that's cool. Might might not be long-term, but I, I feel DC, you know, kind of courted Bendis and get him on board. And he said he wanted to do Superman, or, or they had to offer him Superman before he'd come. And... I think that's you know naturally creating the the need for excitement and and new and inventive things to be done with Superman, which is it's just you know it's it's fun it's fun to have that. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Talk about the Green Lantern Annual Number One, written by Grant Morrison with art by who Giuseppe Calamucci, Camolucci, Camalacciule. Uh, I can never. Can never say names. Um, Grant Morrison with the polls. Uh, I thought this was really fun. Um, what's the name of this story? All right, let me let me just read the cover because you, you rarely get words on the cover, and that's really really nice. They're here among us, a menace from beyond the beyond. Who are they? What do they want? How can anyone stop them? The wireless ones. Dun dun dun. Um, that's fun, and it's it's exactly that level of cheesy horror movie. Like, okay, okay. Hal Jordan wakes up in a bathtub at a family gathering, finds that all his relatives are passed out except for the kids in the family. And so Uncle Hal has to work with the kids to defeat whatever kind of craziness is going on because hell if Hal knows what's happening. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. And then the thing that I thought was really fun is that Hal Jordan pulled up one of his old, or not Hal Jordan, sorry, Grant Morrison pulled up one of his old characters. Or at least one of his old alien races. So when Grant Morrison came on the Green Lantern book, he said he really was excited to to pull back alien races from from comics that we haven't seen in decades. And I think he couldn't help himself but do a little bit of a uh, self pulling. So back when Grant Morrison and Mark Millar were working on the Flash, the Wally West Flash. Uh, booked together in the late 90s, or no, mid-90s, um, 
they did a story in which Wally had to race a being of pure radio energy through space, and both of the their worlds fate depended on it. Um, whoever lost the race or, or fell during the race would would have their planet wiped out. Um, and it was it was kind of cool, I, you know, freaky idea, an alien race of radio energy. That's neat. And so yeah, he brought it back, and and the, they're drawn exactly the same way, just you know, leveled up a bit for the the twenty tens. Um, but then he pulled a thing, and I just knowing Morrison, I have to assume this is an actual thing. Apparently, one of Hal's cousins or nephews, I guess nephews, um, is a superhero with like kind of a shit power um yeah they're radio people and i have radio powers this situation is made for my skill set uncle hal um or cousin hal what does he say it's it's so weird uh and it's just i don't know it's a fun situation where he's like listen you know i could be like you're the robin to your batman and, and i like this line that um that Hal has here that's that's kind of cool. I'm not a superhero kid. Now and again, I hang around with superheroes. I'm a policeman. I like that. I like how Hal might think of himself a bit differently than your average superhero. That's a neat, that's a neat little character moment. Um, and also, you know, Grant Morrison inserting his SJW agenda where Hal's talking about, listen kid, I know that being a superhero might make you think, might make the girl that you're into look at you a bit differently and think you're cool, and it, it does help. But listen, this isn't you. You need to not read the situation right away. Um, and how like walks away, and the kid says to him, whatever, and I didn't say it was a girl. I like that. You know, just take a character that we probably haven't seen in comics in oh, 20, 30 years. And make him gay. Cool. Um, I'm into it. Uh, that's that's a nice little little move. And then, as aliens attack, uh, because this this radio person is is asking for help and shelter, and as people attack, it looks like all will not be well. And Hal's trying to fight him off using. Constructs based in sound. Haha, ha, there's cannon. Um, they they attack him by sending signals to his brainwave that interrupts his ability to communicate with the ring. Classic way to take out a Green Lantern. Loved it. Um, and so Hal's family member, whose superhero identity is Airwave, and I bet that costume has not been updated in the slightest, because it looks terrible. Um, like, it's well drawn, but that costume design is terrible. Uh, it looks like Flash had a baby with black lightning. Um, he, he attacks them and sends them off to the uh, Voyager satellite, because that's a thing he can do with his radio powers. But Hal's like, no, I told you not to do that. You're, you're not reading into the situation enough. You're not thinking this through enough. And sure enough, the alien that had come and was was asking for help is actually the bad guy in the situation, and starts taking over and causing all kinds of stuff. And it's the wireless one. God, that looks really fucking cool. <laughs> um, anyone else getting like a Gremlins vibe for some reason? Anyway, the wireless ones, and it starts broadcast across all the wireless devices in the world, and it's going to turn all of humanity into slaves um and it's just it's very like there's that one great line in um in morrison's action comics run where brainiac is saying all civilizations create me on krypton i was brainiac on earth i am the internet um <laughs> mana says Airwave suit looks like Flash if you were a founding X-Men. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, that's good. Um, so anyway, they, they're like, you know, just everyone's connected to their phone, to their wireless device. And this is just, this is just classic sci-fi style writing where it's like, all right, here's a commentary on, you know, our dependence on technology and kind of a silly story, but maybe you should actually think about how much time you spend on your damn phone. Uh, I like that. I like that quite a bit. Um, anyway, so Hal wakes up and his his family are mind controlled and he's got to try to think of a way without using his ring to get the mind controlling to stop. And his way to do it is to stir up family drama so everyone starts arguing. Um, and that's absolutely adorable. And I have no doubt in my mind that Grant Morrison is pulling from some actual goddamn continuity here. Um, like, this moment really gets me. Susan thought she was marrying a Justice League member. Ha! Huh? Are you seriously suggesting I had a thing for Hal Jordan? This is not as simple as you're saying. No way. Hal's right about one thing. It was best between us when you thought I was Green Lantern, Sue. As soon as you realized it was Hal, not me all along, all the all the fire went out of our sex life. And it's just like this family bickering moment, like like grandma's there, just like sex life, how? Wait until you're pushing him in a wheelchair, honey. Like shit just got real at family dinner. <laughs> it's really funny writing and I Maybe I need to go back. I have a hard time reading Silver Age Hal Jordan comics and stuff, but maybe I do need to go back and see if Grant Morrison is actually pulling from some family history stuff with Hal Jordan. I might need to message um, Myron over at the blog of Oa to see how much of this stuff is like a legit pull, because if that is the case, if there is like some family, some some classic comic book drama where where this girl thought. All do was was Green Lantern, but it turns out he's just Green Lantern's brother. That's great, and I cannot wait for it. <laughs> I'm I'm like legit excited to read that. That sounds hilarious. Anyway, uh, so they they Hal finds a way to um you know work with his his nephew and blast the the alien entity out of him, and then they they trap it and. And a feedback radio loop, scientific bullshit, yada yada yada. And then, don't worry, we don't have to do it for long because Hal calls in the Green Lantern from that sector. The radio wave Green Lantern. Ah, uh, it looks like Sonic the Hedgehog in a Green Lantern costume, god damn it. it it's, that's what that is. No one, no one will defy me. That is Sonic the Hedgehog if you were a Green Lantern. Uh, hashtag canon. Um... So anyway, uh, yeah. And then, like, there's this weird ending that I don't quite get, and I'm not sure what to make of. But, um, it all looks like, oh, it was all just a story the kids made up and Hal went along with so that no one would know that, uh, the crazy uncle of the family spiked the punch and filmed everything. And so Hal punches him out for doing that. But then... Oh no, maybe it was all real. Honestly, I could have done without the fake out, and, and the, the conclusion there does leave me a bit why. I thought that was kind of needless. I thought it, the story worked just fine on its own, really. I, I don't think you needed that. I don't think you needed to, like, oh no, it's, it's too silly for DCs, or we're making it something else, or are we? Um, I thought that was a bit useless at the end. I thought it was fine on its own. <laughs> And again, I, I like I really like the cover here. Hal Jordan's trapped in a smartphone. That's fun. That's neat. I wish comics would do more stuff like this. Apparently, I don't believe him for a second, but apparently this is Grant Morrison's last ever foray into superhero mainstream comics. He's done with it. He's not coming back. He's only going to do self-published and, and indie stuff. I don't believe him for a second. I think this might be his last ongoing series. I think he'll still do the occasional graphic novel or something, like we might get a Wonder Woman Earth 1 Volume 3 or something like that. I'm still really hoping that he does um, Arkham Asylum 2 with the Damian Wayne Batman continuity. Um, but really, 
I, I don't believe that Grant Morrison's done with mainstream comics. So, but if he is, if this is the end of it, it's a really fun way for him to go out. It's it's not it's not you know your your final crisis, big epic storytelling, you know crossover event that's that's commenting on the nature of stories and and the importance of comic book characters and yada yada. It's just fun stories with cool characters and weird strangeness and that's that's just a good time alrighty let's go ahead and move on final book of the night and talk about friendly neighborhood spider-man number nine the secret history of the rumor so the rumor is this old lady superhero that's been set up since uh, pretty much the beginning of this series and now we're getting her origin and it is a reasonably clever origin. Um, but first things first. So they came across this villain uh, as they were entering this this you know shady operation, and they quickly have to run out because he's he's too powerful for them at the moment. And then they ask the rumor, "You look like you knew that guy. You want to tell us about it?" And she goes into her origin. She was a Japanese citizen who was experimented on by the government and turned into a super soldier type weapon, but she defected and fled to Hawaii where she tried to become a naturalized citizen and met Captain America. Uh, and then they had, you know, Nazi fighting super adventures together, um, which is really cool. I like, I like that retcon. Um, but then, because Japanese natives were being uh, rounded up by the American government in World War II, a very shameful time in history that I'm glad this comic's taking some time to think of and, and kind of create a superhero around, um, she decided she wasn't going to fight for the country. She was going to go into the camps and help people in there. And so she is taken to Heart Mountain, which is, you know, an actual camp that uh, the Japanese citizens were held in. And she's just trying to be a hero in a different way in there. But then she comes across Helmuth, who is another person that was experimented on and given superpowers, and he feeds off of misery. And so she um, beat him in the camps, kicked his fucking ass, like, because he deserved it, uh, the bastard, um, and now it looks like he's back in power here, uh, and, and using the, the misery of people trying to crowdfund on the internet to, to feed his powers, um, so Peter goes off to Tony Stark to ask for help, Prowler can't just sit there and wait, so we get, you know, pretty typical dumb superhero drama as he goes to try to take out Helmuth on his own. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, I did really like, again, I really do enjoy Tom Taylor's writing. I think he, it is still Taylor, right? Yeah, okay. I think he's just got a good voice for, like, Spider-Man-esque humor, uh, and that makes it really fun to, to read his stuff. Uh, rumor says, he sits like a spider in the middle of a web of misery. Could we maybe find another analogy? He uh, sits like a viper in a burrow of terrified, helpless mice? Can we just get the little... <laughs> That's a great... That is so goddamn jiffable. Or not jiffable. Uh, memeable right there. That could be great for a meme. Um, uh, so yeah, pretty, pretty good. I gotta say... Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man has really been right up my alley of... I, I just wish Marvel would do shit like this more. It's so refreshing. Like, this is part of an ongoing story arc, but it's not overly long. And in between that, we're getting these nice little one-and-done stories that are just really, really heartwarming, really, really fun stories with Spider-Man. I can... I, why did we ever stop? <laughs> um, this... You know, I started out this night talking about uh, G. Willow Wilson's Wonder Woman, which I am enjoying, 
Um, but my problem with it is it is such just a run where it's story arc after story arc after story arc that's all building on itself, setting up from the very beginning. This is just not that. This is... It's, it's got story arcs, but they're short and they're sweet and they're broken up by one and dones. And that is just the best kind of feeling to read. It's just so good. So yeah, really, really good issue. Uh, had a lot of fun with it. And you know, I think, I think the rumor is an interesting superhero. I'm gonna hazard a guess and say that she's a Tom Taylor original. If she's not, it's a cool idea f to create a, uh, a Japanese superhero who you know helped help people out in the um, the American concentration camps. I really like that. That's a that's a fun idea for a superhero origin in the Marvel universe. Just again, I always talk about this. I really want to take a history class in the Marvel universe. Like, doesn't that just sound like the most interesting shit to you? Just saying. Just saying. Alright, everyone. Thanks very much for watching. That'll do it for comic reviews. And sorry I missed last week. I'll be back next week with Trade Talk. I realize I've been forgetting to upload episodes of Trade Talk, so I'm going to have to go through, do a couple backlog videos of that. But everything will be back up and in order, hopefully by this time next week. So I will see you all there. Till then, bye!